<laughs> okay, okay. What's good, fellas? Man, good to see y'all, man. Damn. Man, good to see you, man. Goodness gracious, it's been some time. Man, been some time, man. We got two, we got two Hall of Famers. We got two future coaches. What are we talking about today, man? What, what, we got a lot. To, what are we talking about today? Hey, how about this though? First, first of all, right, uh, rest in peace to Charlie Moe, right? You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we probably need to start right there. And, you know, rest right. in peace to Charlie Moe, man. Uh, I mean, hey, I, I'm not sure if you guys got a chance to see him play, obviously outstanding player, shooter, extraordinaire score, but the person, Charlie Moe, one of the best people you would have ever met, man. Just a true, true dude. I mean, the whole city, I'm sure, basketball community has got to be devastated. I know I am. I took a lot of calls yesterday, man, but I wanted to make sure we, you know, we we recognize that if we're going to talk for real tonight. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Charlie Moe is a big part of our our city, man. Big part yeah. of what we did is a, as a lot of kids that grew up in my age, they all Charlie Moe represented a major figure for them, somebody that they can lean on and somebody they can uh, look to for guidance. So, you know, that hurt us. We posted about it on the Dog Talk yesterday. Okay, okay, okay. You know, I think that was that was tough, unexpected, as, as you know, this COVID has been and, and just this whole situation, that was really tough. So, um, 2020, 2020's been a rough one, huh? Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. 2020 is really testing the resolve of, of people. You know what I mean? Right. And, and this is the thing about it. This testing the resolve of everybody individually. You know, collectively, right. yes. But individually, you got to go to your own little place, wherever that place is. You know, some people are spiritual, at least for me. Right. Some people it's different things. But right. it's really testing the resolve of each and everybody. And my thing is, I think if we can actually come through this, you know what I mean, you'll be stronger as an individual for it. You know, obviously, Charlie Chase with the heart attack, that was was that's just unfortunate that had nothing really to do with the pandemic or anything that's just <laughs> right. you know the man upstairs calling him home man that's how that you know that's mm -hmm. kind of how that works so let's introduce we got da coach david cox on here coach david cox has been man he has been super instrumental in my life and just my upbringing as a basketball player as a young man as a person that's just trying to figure out you know just figure out their way <laughs> and he was there for me on so many levels and from DC saw coaching to to step in foot in, on campus at St. John's to understanding how to handle St. John's to yeah. understanding how to handle the next level. Just having someone in your corner that side by side was there with me to always, you know, guide me in the right direction. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Keep me in the right place. Keep me in check. That's who David Cox was for me my entire time as a as a from the time I was 13, maybe 12 years old until now. That's who he was for me. Um, it was me and Free kind of talked about it vaguely that when, when I stepped foot at Georgetown at the same time, you stepped foot at Georgetown. And we had a conversation about this. And uh, we, we were both interested to know, we're going to touch on DC and some other things, but we were both interested to know, how did that move come about by you coming to Georgetown? Yeah. I lost you on that last part there, Lumpy. What was the question? I said, how did it come about uh, you getting to Georgetown? Could you hear me? No. Can you can you hear him, Free? Yeah, I, I can hear him. I heard what you said. Free, can you hear him? Yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you tell me what he said? Because I, I can hear you a little bit clearer right now. Uh, he's just saying uh, you coming to Georgetown, um, you know, how, how was it for you? Like, him going to that happened. How did that happen? Oh, okay, okay. So, wow. I'll try to make a really long story short. Uh, uh, I played high school basketball at St. John's. I played college basketball at a small school called William and Mary. Uh, you know, um, I did value my education, so I was able to graduate there with a degree and then get another degree. I had really no hoop dreams outside of you know playing college basketball. Be perfectly honest with you, I always wanted to coach. So I graduate uh, in the fall of 96. I get my master's degree from William & Mary, and, and I jump right in, into Archbishop Carroll in August of 1996 as the assistant dean of students. Uh, and uh, I was just kind of finding my way. I had a, a whole lot of guidance from people over there. Um, uh, um, but then a year into it, Carroll Holmes gave me my first opportunity to coach. I coached the freshman team at Carroll. And it was like a life-changing experience. I always knew that I wanted to coach, but it was my first time really being in charge of a team, having all the responsibilities. And it was like it was life-changing. Like it was, you know, what I'm saying free. It was, it was, it was it. It was like okay, this, this is it. Uh, uh, long story short, 
Uh, I coached there two years, and then I went on to St. John's. I did want to coach at St. John's, um, but I was administrator there, and they felt that it was a conflict of interest. So instead, I worked out with uh, uh, DC Assault. I ended up coaching them for about eight years. Obviously, that's where I coached you guys and a number of you know a number of other guys from the area. That experience right there, you guys know how that is. The traveling that we did, the experiences, seeing other cities, um, obviously uh, seeing other college coaches at the time, seeing kind of how they moved. You know, I started to aspire to do that. Um, right. But at the same time, I was coaching AAU. I had a uh, just had my daughter Layla. Uh, you guys know Layla, and um, I was also assistant principal at St. John's, and that, you know, that was those were crazy hours too. There early, you know, I had to be at night for games. You know, I had to be there on the weekends. I had to be there for parties. <laughs> you know, the whole thing. And at one point, my wife Tasha, you guys know Tasha, she was like, "Hey, you know, baby." Can you kind of make a decision here? You know, this is this is a lot. And I told her, you know what, I, I want to make this leap of faith. You know, I, I want to, I want to, you know, kind of follow my dreams and see if I can get to this coaching thing. So I tried for about three or four years. Another, that's another long story. And uh, the door was shut on me, shut on me, shut on me. Uh, uh, fortunately, you know, God bless me with the opportunity. Uh, my first job was at was at Pittsburgh uh, as director of basketball operations. I was there for one year, and then John, you know, John called me back. Now I had had a prior relationship with John I had you know attempted to get on board the staff a couple of times prior to that I had you know just you know uh met with him a couple of times and talked to him so you know we had a pretty good relationship and uh you know I was uh pleasantly surprised to kind of get that call um there was some movement on their staff and you know there was an opening and uh you know they gave me the call so for me coming from DC you know going back home to you know to Georgetown that was a, a dream a dream come true and then to be there with with you two familiar faces, you know what I mean, early in your careers as well. So I could kind of, you know, as I'm learning, I could, you know, still be there and, 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 uh, and help help you guys as you kind of found your way through. You know, both of you excelled early on the floor, though, so you really didn't have any of those issues. Um, and, and you seem to have a pretty seamless, you know, transition to, to school, too. That's probably because of your backgrounds, probably because the schools you went to, and obviously because mom and dad. But I, I just thought that it was like a perfect, perfect storm it was perfect timing so that that's what that was long so let me ask you this man so me and free coming into georgetown at that time yeah we were the first all americans out of the city to come to georgetown in years right. you have been following us and you knew about us i mean you knew me so personally like the back of my hand uh, let's rewind <laughs> so to give some backstory so he was known as mr cox in our school he was known as Mr. But he was Coach Cox to me, but everybody else knew him as Mr. Cox. So when I'm in school, when people get in trouble, they go to Mr. Cox. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, dang, for real, that's that's pretty cool. Cause if you go to him, you know, but it was a different side of him as well in the school. So that was a different dynamic. But it was funny because when I started my recruiting started heating up, is when you when when I was a junior, you left Pittsburgh. And I remember, and when he's at Pittsburgh, right, uh, he calls and he's like, hey, we want you to come up to Pittsburgh, da 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 got the whole, the pitch was on point, the, everything was sharp. <laughs> <laughs> and I get up to Pittsburgh, and I actually, you know, was not thinking about Pittsburgh at all. Mm -hmm. you know, on the radar, I wasn't even. Georgetown, Georgetown and NC State. Exactly. It was it, at that time it was George China State. And, and, but when he got there and how it was presented to me and the team they had there, Pittsburgh became an interest, a heavy interest for me at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so, so when I finally knew that the transition, me and Free were kind of asking about like the transition. We wanted to know, do you think that the transition for you going from Pittsburgh to Georgetown had anything to do with me and Free going to Georgetown? Did I? No, I didn't think so. No, you guys, I thought had already, had already, you know, I know Free, I think, had decided really, really early. early. Yeah. yeah, and then and then your decision, you know, obviously I didn't know that I was I was I wasn't going to be at Pitt, you know what I mean, a, a, right. another year. And uh, I was trying to make you know one of those coaching splashes. I knew you, I knew how good you would be there right right away. Um, uh, so you know, I kind of jumped in, in in that regard. But no, I thought you guys' decisions were for the for all the right reasons. Great school, <laughs> great program, you know, great co coach ability to play right away. You know what I mean and great fit off the floor, too, you know what I mean? So I, I thought you guys, I thought you made the right decision, you know what I mean? I, I never, you know, honestly, I never blinked an eye at that. I was actually really happy, you know what I mean, that you that you kind of gave us a chance, particularly at that late, you know, at that late stage. That was a that was like a solid for me, you know what I mean? That really was, and I, I'll never forget you and Big O, o, o for that. 
Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, so you think that Georgetown was a great decision at the time for me and for you. I mean, we've been trying to tell people this. At the time, Georgetown was a great decision for us. Yes. No, I, I do. I do think it was, man. I do. I mean, again, I, I know. I mean, again, the first thing people are going to talk about is the system, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and how it kind of, how it kind of constricted, you know what I mean? And we could talk about that at times, but I just thought that just at the time, I mean, again, they're coming off final four run, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and it's home and they want you and they got a 20,000 seat, you know what I mean? They play a 20,000 seat NBA arena hey, right. and it's, and it's, and it's a Thompson, you know what yeah. I mean? It's John Thompson with big John still, still around. So you're now just not thinking about just basketball because the basketball part is going to probably take care of itself, especially you guys with that talented and they had all those connections. But just think about the afterlife, you know what I mean, of a Georgetown graduate. So, I mean, again, my train of thought was like, yeah, that's a really, really smart business decision. Now, as far as the basketball, you know, you know, I probably have a different take for, for both of you. Right. Yeah, no, I, I'm interested to see. What, what do you think? What's your take? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I thought that it was tailor-made for free. I thought it was tailor-made for free, honestly, because free was such, you know, he was such a, I thought he was a really efficient player. You know, right. he, he didn't need need the, you know, ball in, in, in his hands necessarily to make plays. He could score from all three levels. He was comfortable with physicality, so the cutting and the posting was really good for him. You know what I mean? Once he got the, and his footwork was kind of impeccable. He had the high release on so the little step behind to get the three off. All he needed was a little bit of space. You know what I mean? So for him, I, I just didn't think at that time, you know, I don't know, handling the ball and being all sorts of free and loose and running gunning was going to be a way for him to get off. Although he could, he could play in any system. We, we know that. Right. As for you, though, I mean, again, you were, you were a little more, you know, a, a ball dominant. And, mm -hmm. and, and because you made plays with the ball, you know what I mean? It's not a bad thing. Like you were a little more ball down. You were the point guard, you know what I mean? And you, you were so good in ball screens, so good. So I, I just wish that that system at that time, that coach would have allowed for maybe, you know, a few more ball screens, a few more clear outs and ISOs, you know, things of that nature for you to make plays because that offense was really good because, you know, it, it, it could, you know, it could make plays for you. You were the type of player that I thought could, could just right away, you know, right away, you know, let me, second ball, let me figure it out, <laughs> figure it out. You know what I mean? And then, and then make, and then make, and then make the right play. And I thought that the offense, because I didn't know I was learning the offense, just like you guys were. Yeah. I thought that the offense kind of had adaptations to that. And, right. and, and the way John ran it, you know, which again, he was very successful. It, it, it didn't have necessarily those adaptations, but I learned later on in my career that that offense was used by a number of NBA teams in a number of different ways, you know, even the triangle offense was a, you know, was, was, was a similar to that. Um, and when I was at Rutgers with Eddie Jordan, who had worked in the NBA, he used it there. So we used it at Rutgers and we used it with a much faster pace. And we didn't go to the fifth or sixth option, first option, we, you know what I mean? Right. Similar to an NBA pace. And I right. thought, I was like, oh man, I really like this. I actually use, I use some of it now. You know, and it's, it's funny, and I talked about this. People don't understand is when I was making a decision to go to college, you got to think of where the NBA was and what was going on in the NBA because everybody had aspirations against the NBA. The top scorer in the league, top five scorer in the league was Gilbert Arenas. Gilbert Arenas was the top five scorer in the league, and he played for Eddie Jordan. Eddie Jordan was oh. an offense. They had You're going in and out on me right now, Alon. Oh, man. He was saying he, he was saying uh... – one of the top five scorers in the NBA at that time was Gilbert Arenas, and Gilbert Arenas ran the Princeton with the Wizards. Yes, yes, right. Yes. And, and and also they had going to the finals playing in the Princeton. So yes, that's, like, yeah, pretty much. Yes, because remember Gilbert could knock down the three. Obviously, he could break you down off the bounce and score it at the rim. But he also had that mid post game. You know what I mean? Like he he had that pivot and that stuff too. So he wouldn't cut and post as deep as you. You know what I mean, free because you were big enough and physical enough to get low on those cuts and score easily around the rim or in the paint. And you had the mid range game. Like Gil, yeah, he was skilled enough to, you know, know that he didn't need to cut that deep. But yeah, you could, it's basketball, fellas. Like it's a beautiful brand. It's a beautiful brand of basketball if you know what you're, you know, what you're looking at. And I think you do have to know how to mesh that with your personnel. Yeah, I think so. I think we're meshing it with our personnel because the personnel change. Um, for, for our coach when we got there. The type of players that were coming in when we got there as opposed to when they went to the Final Four, 
was a drastic change. The type of players that I mean, they came in with John Watson. They were all great in their own right, but the development right. process that they had to go through. When we got there, when you got Dewan Summers there, you got Greg yeah. Monroe in there. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's kind of it was a different mentality for us, you know. So, and eventually, if you look at Coach Thompson, eventually he did start speeding his offense up. No, he did absolutely. And that, and that was the the craziest thing about it. I'm sitting there watching the games like, ain't this a bitch? <laughs> 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 I'm serious. I was like, wow. They are really, you know what I'm saying? They sped the game up, and it was, and I noticed it. I noticed it when I was being recruited. That's what uh, Jason Kidd ran with Byron Scott. You know, right. so it was a common offense that was being run, but yep. Yep. we did it. It just didn't over, it didn't, it didn't glorify our strengths, and I think that took away from the overall picture for us individually. You yep. know, but I, I do think it was a way for us, you know, we won a lot of games. We were top 10 every year that we were there. <laughs> so absolutely absolutely and and if you really think about it i mean you you i'm sure both you and free took some of those things with you to the next level i'm sure you did quick cutting you know a quick cutting post or at, at t- it had to be some some aspect of that game you had to take with you come I'm on a, chris somebody I'm I'm no, no, there was a lot of things that i i, I took from out the Princeton, like just like me and Chris talk about it all the time, saying, you know, just being around the rim and finishing, like, yes, all those yes, layups and all that stuff. Like, we took that into, you know, when we started playing after after Georgetown, or if we saw somebody just cut back door with the guy not yep. looking, we're throwing that back door pass just because we know that guy's open there. It's like just those little things like that. Um, I feel like we took that into, you know, our professional career. Um, yeah. You yeah. Say yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, the layups, the layup, the finishing is the yep. biggest thing I'm taking from Georgetown. What about the cutting? What about the cutting, Chris? Like, did you did you do uh, did you feel like you did more backdoor cutting as you got to become you know a little bit older and as you became a pro, or, or no? Was that always? Yeah, I'm doing. I, I'm telling you, if somebody turns their head, I'm gone. Cut that's anyway. A natural, that's a natural instinct for me at this point. Like, if if you turn your head, you lose. Right. Your, you lose of the ball, what's going on? I'm right behind you. That's a bucket. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. for me, you know? So, Absolutely. one thing I did learn at Georgia, and if somebody cuts back door, if them hands are up or down, I'm throwing right past the air. Right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> like, that's basketball. There you go. Read and react. Yeah, no doubt. So you did learn. You learned. But, and we talked about, we just, it's funny we talking about it. We just had this conversation with uh, Jason and Henry. When you become pros after being in that system for so long, you have to learn how to deprogram. Yeah. <laughs> The yeah. Georgetown effect is real yeah. to the point where you getting out there, you like people like, yo, shoot the ball. Man, right, right, right. You only <laughs> taking the perfect wide open one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was real. It took a time to get that out your mind to yeah. because yeah. the way we played was very it forced you to be unselfish, you know. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it was interesting. Uh, I got a question for you. You left when you left Georgetown. That was tough for me because I remember you coming to talk to me at, and like, listen, this is what I'm going to do. This is what, you know, what's, what do you think? And I was like, I mean, what do you mean? What I think? You got to do what you got to do. But it was just the fact that he came to me and talked to me about that. That meant a lot. How was that decision for you? I, you coming back home finally. You're at Georgetown. I mean, you're there with guys that are from home, me and Free are from home. I mean, you, you grew a relationship with Coach Hunter. I mean, it was it was a family. It was kind of an environment that we had that you would want to be around, you know, because we had – it was all people from the area on that staff, <laughs> in the gym, on the recruiter. So when it came time for you, obviously it's business. What was the, what was the decision process for you um, when it came time to make that move to Rutgers? Well, well, it was tough. It was definitely tough, as you mentioned, man. I mean, again, you know, that, that was home base for me. You know, my whole family, my mother, my father, my, my, my cousins, my brother says everybody's from from home. They were able to come out and see me and support me. That was huge. My, my friends, you know, locally were able to come out and, and, and see me. And uh, so the, it, it was tough. But but from a business point of view, I, I, I thought that it was something that I that I needed uh, that I needed to do. It was a great opportunity, first of all, like. I was going to be, I don't know, 34, 35 at the time. I was going to Rutgers, which was in the Big East Conference. And uh, and uh, uh, I was being promoted to associate head coach. You know, at that time, for somebody like me, you know, trying to climb that ladder, figure out how to navigate this whole thing Big and move. become a head coach at some point, you know. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Okay, yeah, that was kind of one of the, you know, the, uh, 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 the next step, I thought. Also, I guess it's kind of similar to you guys in a sense, and I'm talking to you guys as, as competitors. You know how it is sometimes when you go to some place and it's kind of already a machine. Like if you played on the AAU team and you've got, you know, four or five guys, it's like a machine. And it, it's 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 fun. It's definitely fun. You know what I mean. And it's you served your purpose by winning and playing well and all that type of stuff. But then there's something in you. You know what I mean. Personally, that's like you know what. You know, I, I need a little bit more of a challenge. And can I do this on my own? Can I be? Can I be a little bit more of a focal point? I just felt like Georgetown was a machine and will always kind of be a machine. You know, and uh, I needed to, to to kind of branch out there and see if I could. Uh, carry a little bit more weight, a little bit more responsibility, whether that was scouting, whether that was recruiting, you know, wh wh whatever it may be. I kind of wanted that weight. I wanted that challenge at that time in my career. Like, like that's kind of exactly how I was thinking. And I'm saying I'm going to Rutgers. They're at the bottom. You know, if I can make a couple things happen, you know what I mean, with this staff, we can we can elevate this program. You know, that might help, obviously, me and my, you know, future endeavors. So I, I'm thinking all those things all at the same time. And the type of person I am, I was like, you know, once I'm once I'm there, you know, it's like conviction, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know, what I mean, let's do it, let's chase this, and uh, and, and see how it see how it ends up. But it was, you know, it was definitely tough, you know, because of all the relationships, as you mentioned. I remember talking to Chris when uh, I was like, dog, who are we gonna sit by on the bench? <laughs> <laughs> I remember from beginning of freshman year, we sat by you. Nowhere, right. nowhere else on the bench we would go. That's Come love. In, go sit right by you. Yeah, yeah you know why, right? Because I can read. Because right. I could really read body language, and I would tell you exactly what the fuck it was. Excuse my language. I'm sorry, you might have to take that out. But you know what I mean. So if Chris's case, when he came out, he gave me that look. <laughs> you know, I'll Come sit down, young fella. I know, I know, I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just the look alone. You know what I mean? Yeah, he I wouldn't see. say much. Free wouldn't say much. He usually, you know, he was usually okay. I would only really have to say something to Free if he was angry. You know what I mean? Oh man, he got some, you know, some real fire, <laughs> some emotion about something. Okay, you know what I mean? But Free was mostly okay. Chris, you come off with, and uh, excuse me, and some of those looks, man. Some of those looks. I'm like, man, let me get to him first. I got him, Coach. Send him here. <laughs> oh, I used to be. I'd be trying to figure out what am I doing. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> there be times I'm coming out of the game like, what has happened, man? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Did I did I shoot? Did I play defense? Did I, I don't know what happened. Free, hey, free. This was this was your man too, and this was like every time he came out because you know he just wanted to play. Had that you know I'm out here now. I'm starting yep. to get loose. Yep. Come on, <laughs> right, right. And I hear somebody on the bench. Hey, slow it down. I'm like, what are we slowing down for? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, I said. <laughs> You know how I get. So I, I used to have that edge about me. So yeah, he right. We had to only sit next to you and Coach yeah. Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna sit nowhere else. Man, that's, that's all right. right. I just that's noticed right. that you went from Pittsburgh to Georgetown to Rutgers. That's three big E schools that you started off with. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was I was I was blessed, man. And, and, and you know what? I was supposed to head actually when I resigned from St. John's, I resigned. I gave my, 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 my letter, I think, in March. Uh, uh, I was scheduled to go to Morgan State. You know, Bose had just got the job, and he was, he was going to hire me as an assistant coach. So for about a month and a half, I was actually, you know, I was still at St. John's, but I was communicating a lot with Bose, you know, about, about that position. He was walking me through it, you know what I mean? Because, again, it was going to be my first time at the collegiate level, and he had all that experience. And then, you know, maybe six weeks into that, uh, um, I got a call that uh, that uh, Pittsburgh had this opening at the director of basketball operations spot. I had no idea what that was or what that meant. I just know it was Pittsburgh. It was the Big East. They've been winning. You know, let let right. me in. You know, right. please. Yeah. And I remember, I remember, you know, driving up there and uh, and uh, you know, I guess killing the interview and and I ended up getting the job. I had a few good people, you know, speak on my behalf. One one being Troy Weaver, you know, who had coached right. there, the new general manager of Detroit, who's also, you know, from home. So, uh, you know, he, he was he was very, you know, instrumental uh, in that regard. Right. Right. Yeah, that, go ahead, Free. I got a question for you, Coach Cox. Um, Talk to me. Hey, Free, oh. first of all, man, how, how, how's the family, man? Family's great, man. Family's yeah. great. Okay, yeah. okay. Everybody's good? Okay. I haven't seen them in so long, man. Yeah, they're doing good. I'll okay. tell them I was just talking. I'll tell them I was talking to you. 
Sure. Yeah, make sure you tell them I said hello. All right, what you got for me, bro? All right. What major lessons did you learn as a player that you transferred to as a coach? Okay, I, I got pieces of that. What did I learn as a player that I'm – that I'm, I'm fly as a coach. You learn as a player that you transfer to uh, as being a coach. Did you hear yeah, me? Almost got it. Nope. Try it again. What major lesson did you learn as a player that you transferred to, you know, being a coach? Oh, okay. As a player. I'm like, okay. Well, first of all, <laughs> I was a good player, but I was never a great player. Okay. So, I don't know how great players think. <laughs> you guys got to answer that question. <laughs> As a good player, I was, I was, you know, I was, I was humbled early, you know what I mean, by probably some greater players. And I realized that it, it was a team game, you know what I mean? So I, I think that that kind of helped my philosophy, you know what I mean, being a team game. So I, I kind of coined the phrase, share the game. Uh, I also was a, a really hard playing defender. Like I took a lot of pride in my defense. If I couldn't score, you know, 20 points, I was going to try to keep you from, from, from scoring 20. And I didn't score 20 a lot. So I was really, you know, trying to keep other guys from scoring. So my defensive mentality also, I also, you know, brought with me, you know, if you can defend at a high level, you can be in, in, in any, in any game. Um, what, what else? I guess just pro probably an, an overall work ethic as a, as a player. You know, as much as you guys have to be in the gym to hone your skills, you know, hundreds and thousands of hours, you've got to give that same that same energy to, to being a coach, you know, that same drive. You've got to you've got to study this game, you've got to continue to learn. This game evolves every year. You know what I mean? It's not like, hey, okay, I got it now. No, you got you know, you've got to continue to evolve with it. So I would say those are probably three the three biggest things I just took as, as a player because I was always as a player you know, because again, I wasn't the tallest or the fastest or, or what have you, uh, but I competed, you know, uh, I was always trying to learn the game so I could, you know, anticipate things and that, that might help me in those instances. Yeah, so for you, what as a coach, you've been a coach now, I mean, over maybe 10 plus years now as a, as a college basketball coach. Yeah, so I'm now, this, I'm going to my 15th year of, of, of college right. basketball coaching, you know, to take that with my eight as an AAU, so that's 23 years of coaching now. 23 years of coaching. What has been the biggest adjustment for you coaching-wise going from an assistant coach to head coach? What has been the biggest adjustment now that you have your own? Oh. Well, you, you know, just just that in and of itself, you know, having your own program. You have now all of the weight on you. The buck stops with you. So, you know, now every decision that you make uh, uh, will absolutely affect you. I would say the biggest difference, and I've said this to a number of people, is basically the, the number of decisions that I have to make per day has jumped tremendously, and the impact of each of those decisions on the program, you know, has, has you know, grown exponentially. For example, as an assistant coach, you know, I could probably pass the buck here and there. You know what I mean? If we had, you know, so I might have five things on my notepad a day that I had to check off, and then I could pass the buck on a few others. That assistant coach has to worry about that. Hey, the head coach, that's why he's getting paid. He got to worry about that. You know what I mean? Right. Now right. I'm the head coach. You know what I mean? So right. I've got to have my posts on everything. That that list of things every day as I'm going into work is much, much bigger. I've got to be conscious about all those decisions because even the littlest thing impacts impacts your program. Obviously, that goes, you know, for in season, you know, obviously, you know, as well as during games when those decisions now become fast and furious and each and every decision that you make, you know, it, 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 it matters. So, you know, just, I guess the whole, the pressure of it all, the urgency of it all and the weight of it all, it, it, it all has changed, but shoot, man, you guys are, again, man, you guys are gamers. You know what I mean? I, I tell people this all the time. You know, I, I truly love this, man, that, that, that little feeling I get before the games of a little bit of queasy, a little bit of anxiety, but then some right. anger mixed in with it. I love that. You know what I mean? Right. You know, I, I love that. So it's a challenge, basically. You know, I see all of this as a challenge and a blessing, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm in a, I'm in the, I'm in the right frame of mind. And with the, I say this a lot of times to the people from home too, and that's no slight to anybody else. I just know home and I know, you know, how you guys have come up because I came up the same way. I know how you move. I know, you know, uh, how intelligent you have to be to make it through all of the different obstacles that exist in the DMV. With that being said, because you guys have that mentality, I think 
I think that you two, obviously you were great players. I think you two would be outstanding, outstanding coaches. I think you'd be great in, in anything you do because of that background, because of your background. But I just think as far as coaches, I think you guys would be, would be great coaches just because of your understanding of people, of the game, you know what I mean? Uh, all, of, all of those things. I, well, I appreciate that, Coach. I really do. Um, Absolutely. I it's something I can't believe Free is coaching already. I still that still tripped me out when he said he wasn't playing no more. I blew my mind. He we've had this discussion. Yeah, right. Gonna be for some time, but he, I he, he snuck right over there. I yeah. did. I you did. know the demaffable. You see, he came on here with a demaffable shirt on, right? You know, I, I see that. that. Yeah. yeah. St. John's guys here. I see that. You know, I told him. I said we finally. I said we gonna have Cox on, so you know we outnumbering y'all today. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> With the that's right. That's right. That's probably the only way we'll. That's probably the only way we'll beat them too. Guys. That's the only way. <laughs> only way. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> hey, so I, I got another question for you. Um, over the years, over your your years of coaching, twenty three years, twenty plus years of coaching, how has your philosophy or your just your overall principles for how you want to coach or how you want to govern your team, how's that changed, or if it has changed in any, any way? Well, <laughs> well, you can. Guys, no, my first experiences, I was relatively young. I was like 23, 24. You know, I was coaching freshman basketball, you know, so I was coaching 14 and 15 year old kids from, from DC mostly, you know, or PGK. And then I was coaching DC assault. So you right. can imagine what my mentality was initially, you know what I mean? It's like, let's go get them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> right. Let's go. <laughs> Beat him. <laughs> Take his ball, block his shot. You know what right. I mean? All of that, you know, a lot of a lot of individual stuff, a lot of hype, you know, a lot of emotion. You know, <laughs> you guys know how it was. But, right. yeah, it, what happened then, you take that emotion on the road somewhere, as we've all been, and yeah. you get you get wiped off the floor by a non-emotional, well-coached team, and you Ooh. say to yourself, hey, man, you know what? I, I probably need to learn a little bit more about this game, you know what right. I mean, than I, than I actually thought I know. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally different. Like, so now, obviously, I'm, you know, a little less emotional, a, a lot more knowledgeable, uh, a, a much more better understanding of just the philosophy of basketball uh, uh, or different philosophies, rather, of, of, of the game, offensively and defensively. And, uh, you know, I, I love it. Like I said, man, I, I, I love, you know, I love everything about this game because it continues to evolve. And, you know, you can just learn so many new things and there's so many nuances to this game. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I love it. So, yeah, the philosophy has changed drastically from the beginning to now, and it, and it continues to change, too. At least I, I'm hoping that I continue to evolve. That's a bold of mine. Right, right. Yeah, that's – that's. I can imagine. I mean, you go from – I mean, the level that we were recruited. I'm, Coach used to – so, Coach, when we played with D.C. Assault, would stop. Before we go on our road trips, he used to run to me. I used to be in his car all the time. And he would stop, and he'll get the cleanest, freshest white T-shirts he can get. That was the thing. <laughs> he would get the crispiest joints he could find. <laughs> the crispiest things he could find. And that was the coaching uniform. I mean, <laughs> that was it. That was, that was it. it. Straight that was up. it. I knew what time it was if he got the crispy joints. You know, the white t-shirt has still got the lines on them. <laughs> yes, right out the bag. Yes, if I had a fresh white tee, I probably wore that uniform for about 10 straight years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So uh, now you, you've always, and, and since you've been a head coach and even just recruiting as a coach, you've always used the DMV as your recruiting base. Mm -hmm. Always came home and got local talent. How, why is that so important to you? Why is that an emphasis for you? It's home. Right. It's all I know. Hey, until I turn, honestly, I'll be honest with you here. I'm so, you know, D.C., D.M.V., whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? I'm so home that I had the same mentality as, in, you know, all of my friends and 90% of the rest of D.C. and my age group. Right. Until I turned probably 25, 28, I never thought I was going to leave the city, nor did I want to leave the city. I right. just, you know, I, I, I love everything about, I love everything about home, you know right. what I mean? From from go go to church to, you know, to the mall, to Georgia Avenue, to the basketball, to, I, I just love everything about it. And I love, I love the people, man. And, and, uh, and I've had so many uh, uh, people back home who've uh, influenced me and then supported me, you know, throughout my journey, man. I, I just feel like, you know, 
it's it's home, it's it's love, it's it's home base. And just, you know, business wise, strategically as a coach, I mean, I always thought, hey man, if I'm gonna jump out here and become assistant coach, I've I've got to have a home base. I've got to have somewhere where I can always, you know, go and at least, I don't know, get a player, get in the mix or something. And right. uh, you know, fortunately home has been has been really so why go anywhere else? It's the it's the Mecca. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, it's 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 it. It's the we're, we're, home is the Mecca. You know, I can always find talent, talent there. Right. Yeah. And that, and that was kind of, I was kind of leading you into that question because I, 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 it wants to be known, like, as a Georgetown kid, and we're always going to be Georgetown, we're going to kind of always go back to Georgetown because that's us. <laughs> but at, for some reason, Georgetown stopped getting these guys. And I'm going to be real with you. I didn't know who Jamarco Pickett was before he stepped foot at Georgetown. I didn't even know he was from the city. I'm not even trying to be funny or nothing like that. I had no clue who Jamarco Pickett was. You know, so for a time, we have stopped getting the ones out of the area for so long. And I think that's that's what's led to an extended type of deficit for us in, in many ways. And I just wanted to hear from a, a a coach that's not, even though you're, you're you will always be DMV, but you're not coaching here right now. The one that his main base is, is DMV, and that's why you've been successful. You know, and for some reason, I just I don't know why there's a disconnect with the with the community and Georgetown. I I, I don't understand why, and I'm and I'm yeah, trying that, to- that that was hard part for me to 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 understand, particularly since I'm not there. I I, I know that um. I know that it's always been, you know, a place, at least when I was growing up, that had, you know, some of the best, I yeah. mean, some of the best D.C. ballers. I mean, from Charles Smith and, and John Turner to my to my Baltimore guys and Reggie Williams and, and Dave Wayne. I mean, just players and, and you guys, you know, Jeff Greens, the Roy Hibbert. So, yes, it's always it's always been that way. I don't know where the disconnect uh, uh, came. Uh, I'm, I'm always rooting. Uh, for home, you know, Georgetown and Maryland, I'm, I'm always rooting for them. So, you know, I, I would hope that they can, they could figure that out because again, that's a, you know, that's Georgetown, man. It's a story program. That's the home of big, that's the home of big John. And he built that on the backs of DC basketball players. So yeah, I, I would, you know, I would hope, and I'm, I'm sure that they are, you know, trying to figure that out, you know, right now. Right. Yeah. Especially with free in the mix over there, that the math guy get some more the math kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm trying over there, man. I'm trying. Got some guys over there, Coach Cox. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. we go. Um, there we go. And but, it's all about relationships too. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it's all about relationships too, man. And uh, I mean, there's so many, there's so many, there's so many schools, so many AAU programs, so many knowledgeable basketball minds there in D.C., you know, it's easy just to kind of just get out there and, uh, and, and and meet and mingle with them people. I mean, all good all good dudes, too, man, you know, yeah. all, all, all good dudes, like I said. And I'm saying this, you know, and I don't get players, you know, or I haven't necessarily gotten players from all programs, but I can tell you this much, you know, I've, I have felt some semblance of love and or support from 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 all the programs back home. I mean, I felt no, 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 no hate at, at all, man, and uh, – you know, I, I will always, again, that's home. I, I will always come back, no matter <laughs> where I'm coaching. You know, me and Chris are trying to get into coaching, uh, trying to get into the college game at, at that. Um, you know, any advice for us, you know, uh, for, you know, the long run, trying to get into this game? Yes. Okay. First of all, uh, first thing, dream big. big. Absolutely. You want to be a college coach, dream big. Put that in your mind right now. I'm going to be a college coach. That's first and foremost. Okay. Understand, uh, 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 understand how, how hard, and how time-consuming it is. How hard because <clears throat> getting in is just the hardest part. Honestly, getting in is the hardest part. And then once you're in, you know, uh, this is like uh, uh, this is like the wild, wild west, man. <laughs> you know, as assistant coaches, you get one-year contracts. You've got to produce, or you know, you might not have a job the next year. So you're moving your wife, your fiance, all around the world or all around the country, that is rather, and uh, there really no assurances. So you've got to have tremendous tremendous work ethic so just your understanding prior to getting into this has to be high level like this is going to be high level high level work uh i would say forge as many relationships you can in the basketball world particularly where you guys are at just forge those relationships you know what i mean you have no enemies none i know you play against teams whether it's high school or au sidelines no enemies forge relationships also 
you know, uh, uh, start evaluating players right now. Start evaluating players right now from the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade. Have yourself your own little catalog for when the time comes, you know, two years, three years down the line, you're already set. You've been kind of, you've seen these guys, you know what you're talking about. Because once you get a job, you know, then boom, right away, there are expectations. <laughs> okay, you know, you're from DMV, you're from DeMatha, you're from St. John's, Georgetown. Uh, okay, okay, you said you were going to produce. All right, give me, you know, your top 10 guys right now who you've been sp speaking to, who you have relationships with. You know, they're, who do you know? You know what I mean? Who can we get in on right now? Boom, they're putting you right there to the fire. You, you know what I mean? So you, you might as well just start thinking along those lines now. Then the basketball portion, which is going to come second. Again, nobody's going to hire you. No head coach is hiring you right now to come and help them win games X and O's wise. You know what I mean? Coach has been around for 15, 20, 25 years and I'm hiring you to do that. That was something that I had the misconception of. Like, shoot, when I become an assistant coach, you know what I mean? I'm going to be helping coach. No, you've got to, you've got to play your role. So the first role, obviously, is probably going to be recruiting and relationships that you have. And the second thing is going to be, yes, your basketball knowledge. It will come out, whether it's in individual workouts, whether it's in scouts or what have you, you know, what your degree of knowledge is. So you need to start, you know, uh, uh, working on that now, you know, whether it's individual skills and or, you know, how teams play, how teams run their offense, high school, college level, NBA. I watch it all. I mean, I literally, I watch it. I watch it all. So I can have, you know, at least some knowledge of what I'm talking about, you know, X's and O's wise. So that's what I would say. Dream big first. Just, you know, okay, you want to do this? Okay, I'm going to do it. But then immediately understand this is going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be some politics. going to be some, there's going to be some bumps in the road. You know, they're not going to be a whole lot of insurances. I'm not going to make a whole lot of money. I'm going to have to work really, really, really hard. That's first. If you're not willing to do any of that, then leave this thing alone. Leave it alone. Then once you get in, you have to be ready to produce. So you might as well start setting yourself up for that right now. That's what I would say. Right. And is that, and how, and the kids, you're starting to see that more kids and more people, um, their careers are, you know, just from our, from my understanding and my coming up, guys are stopping earlier and trying to get in the game. And guys are, are like, they stopping at 26. I think Nolan stopped at maybe 25, 26. You know, three is at 30 now. I'm at 30. And guys are thinking about this now. And you think it's an advantage? Even though these guys, like for my situation, my situation is this. I can play. I feel like I can play for maybe six, seven, eight more years. But if I think that it could be an advantage for me to, if I could find a way to get in now, to set myself up. is That's a kind of a dilemma. And I think a lot of guys who are kind of on the fence, if they want to play or if they want to jump into the next phase or transition, I don't even like call it a transition. It's kind of just adjusting with the times. But it's... It, how how what, what kind of advice would you give someone like that? Because that's something that I think people are battling. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I mean that I say, hey man, that's one of that's one of uh that's one of life's challenges, it's one of life's crossroads right there. You know what I mean? As you kinda end in one career or one relationship or what have you, or one run with one team and you've kind of transitioning into the next. You know, I, I, I would say this, you know, you've got to kinda ask your, yourself, you know, have you have you you know, have you reached your, your, your ultimate goal of, of playing professionally? You know, yes. Have you, have you, have you made, you know, uh, yourself uh, uh, enough money uh, to build a nice little nest egg just for the next couple of years as you might have some, you know, financial troubles in this? You know, you have to answer that question. Right. Uh, uh, um, uh, do, you, do you absolutely, you know, love this game? The fact that you're contemplating out of playing or coaching, that answers that question right there. So you definitely have love for this game. You need to be in this game you know, uh, uh, somehow or way. I would say, though, make sure you get all of the playing out of you, though. Just get all of them. I mean, you know, when you know, I think you know. Get all of the playing out of you and then and then make the decision, you know, just to shut it down. I don't think right now you even got to project that far ahead right now, five, six years. You know, I think you go out there and you crush it this year, to be honest with you, Lump, and then you see how you feel at the end of that year. And if you think, think you still got some more good ball in you, you go out there and you crush it again, you know, and then and then you come back. Just keep in mind, though, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm sure you asked this question for this reason, mainly. Just keep in mind, though, that, yes, there is it's not an age requirement, but there's a there's a time ticker because there's some guys, as you said, that are starting this thing at 25, 26. But guess what? There's some of them that starting like 22, 23. Like as soon as they get out of school, they become the video coordinator or the grad assistant. And then two or three right. more years later, like they're right there in the mix. Those are the guys that you're going to end up battling against. Now, as a basketball player, you know, you would destroy them. 
But right. as a coach now, they've been now, you know, up under some probably pretty good staffs and coaches for five, six, seven, eight years. They've got a pretty good, they've got a pretty good jump on you. So yeah, you've got to, you do have to factor that in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can see that. You know, I can, yeah, that's something that you got to think about. Guys be in the game, boy. They, they fresh out. As soon as they step foot on college campus as a freshman, right. sophomore, they like, look, this is what I want to do. This is yeah. how I want to do it. So yeah. by the time I'm 28, 29, I'm on somebody's bench and I'm, you know, this how I'm living. You know, that's, yep. that can be a strong route to go. What's the, as a coach now, and you're a college basketball coach, um, the recruiting has changed. What, actually, but let me ask you this. What's the, what's the state of college basketball now? Yeah. What, what is college basketball? Where, where are we going at this current time? What can fans, what can people expect about college basketball? If with, this, with, with the season and this pandemic? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I'm, I'm going to guesstimate that the best case scenario is that we either lose non-conference and or just push the season back. That's what I would think is best, is best case scenario. And even in that scenario, I don't, I don't see it being uh, uh, getting to the point where we're going to have full capacity at arenas, you know, perhaps until, you know, maybe until the, 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 the end of the season. But, you know, right away, I don't even see that happening. So in terms of pushing back, what do you mean push back until another like to the to the spring or push back yeah. until? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I'm thinking maybe January. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And now, so that would probably leave just conference only play. That could lead to only conference only play, or or you know you know, I'm sure there'll be some conflicts with arenas and scheduling and stuff like that. But you know maybe they could just push you know the majority of the season back. That's all, and just kind of reschedule some games. That would be probably. Uh, logistically really tough. Uh, but I'm sure that most teams are going to still push for that as well because, as you know, you know, 20-game season, jumping right into conference play <laughs> with no warm-ups, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, easy. that's going to be tough. <laughs> oh, it would just be like yeah. conference play, like just conference play, no conference tournament? Yeah, it would probably be conference play, conference tournament, and then NCAA tournament, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yes. So how, did, how did your season end this year? So we, we, we ended up 20, 21 and nine. We ended up uh, third, third place in the league. We were 13 and, and five. We had a, uh, you know, we had a, we had a really strong year, man. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we got the double bye for the A-10 tournament. So we, we were kind of sitting pretty there. You know, we were automatically in the quarterfinals and uh, we were probably going to be playing a team that, you know, we had beaten earlier, but a good team. Uh, that we would beaten early. And then if we'd have won that game, we would have had an opportunity to play against one of the teams that we lost to in, in, in conference play. So, I mean, we were, we were really excited about, uh, uh, about our draw. Did you play a game? Did y'all play a tournament game? We did not. We did no. not. We did not. Yeah, no. We were scheduled – we weren't scheduled to play until Friday. They had games on Wednesday. We got there somewhere around Wednesday evening. To be honest with you, I was a little bit queasy because it was New York City and it was, you know, the, the pandemic was – you know, I was already – you know, my antennas were already up, honestly. By the next day, as things started to cancel kind of around us, things started to close down, you know, other conference tournaments started to get canceled. I was saying to myself, well, yeah, this is this probably is not going to get off, and I can't wait till they tell us so I can drive back home and get in, and get out of here. And uh, that's what we did. We got out of there quickly. Right. So y'all are going through this now. I, I can only imagine as a as a head coach and with your staff how you're trying to adjust in this time in terms of trying to be active, in terms of uh, trying to keep your kids active. Yes. What, what 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 is the what is the the program for your returning players, the ones that are there now? How are they trying to be active? I mean, how can they stay locked in at some sort of capacity? <laughs> Yeah, well, every college coach has this dilemma right now because, again, not only do you have the pandemic and the concerns about the virus, but obviously you've got all the civil unrest, too, with the protests because of George Floyd. And a lot of our guys come from cities. They come from D.C., they come from Philly, they come from New York, they come from Richmond. You know what I mean? They come from some of those cities where that civil unrest is. So my whole, my whole, you know, me, guys, my whole philosophy was, hey, uh, hey, guys, would you rather be at home or would you rather be here? They all raise their hand. You know, I think we'd be safer and more comfortable up there with you. Okay, so about three or four weeks ago, we, we got with our administration. Our administration was great. They support us tremendously, and they allowed us to bring our players back. Now, we cannot start anything. We can't do anything with them, you know what I mean, formally. 
because practices won't officially start until July the 20th, which is Monday. But we were able to get them back. They're in uh, online classes. They're staying in the dorms so, that, so, they're, so they're safe. Uh, they have access to some outside hoops right now and then some local recs, some local rec centers. So they're here. They're safe. You know, they're eating. We can see them. You know what I mean? Uh, so no real programming right now is, is being done anywhere uh, in the country. Uh, so it's a, it's as you, the first question you asked, what are you guys doing right now? I mean, every day is a new obstacle, a new task, a new whatever. You know what I mean? Every single, every single day. Because the you know each day the, the virus is either going up or going down, so each state in and of itself is having all these different mandates. You've got to quarantine if you come from here. You got to quarantine if you come from here. We're trying to keep track of all of that, keep our guys out of the way. Yeah, it's a lot right now. I mean, it's a lot, and not a lot of basketball. It's just, but it's a lot. And it's and I, and it's great. And I'm hearing what you said is that you asked these guys, and I have a two part question. You've asked these kids. What the, do they feel comfortable with? You feel comfortable staying home? You feel comfortable coming back to school? Um, the first part of that question is, what are the thoughts? With all this that's going on right now and with just how America is, I mean, it has been going on, but how it's so blatantly on TV, what's going on to, to, to Black people, how we're being treated, treated. What is the thought process for these kids that are 18, 19? What are they thinking? How are they viewing their lives, how they're viewing the, just everything that's going on. Because I have my well, and I have what I understand. Um, but as a young kid, a kid that's going through this process, what what do you kind of get as their interpretation of what's going on? You know what? It, it's, it's funny you say that. I, I think, first of all, this this generation of this particular generation has become very conscious. I think they have. I don't know if it's because of the older people in their life. I don't know if it's because the influx of news, obviously with social media, everything now is being spit, regurgitated right back out. So you have almost, you know, if you are alive and have a post and you're on social media, you're going to know what's going on. But it's, I think it's helped to make them more conscious about what's going on, you know, uh, how it's affecting them, uh, how it has affected, you know, other people, other black people, uh, older generations. Uh, so that's the first thing. I think they're more conscious. I, I, I also think that, you know, there's probably a few, there's some, some mixed feelings. There's some fear. I mean, I think there's truly, there's truly some fear there. You know, you know, what are we going to do? Because we are in the cities. We, enter, you know, we, we see the police, we see the sirens, you know, they, we interact with them in our neighborhoods, you know what I mean? So, so it's inevitable that there's going to be some sort of interaction. So I think there's a sense of fear there. I think there's some confusion, you know, as to, you know, how we got to this point. I think there's also probably some anger, you know, uh, that's that's seeping through. And that's probably coming from, again, all the protests and all the things that they're seeing and they're hearing. I mean, it's just a mixed. I know I'm answering your question with a, a lot, but so just a mixed bag of emotions, I think, that they're kind of going through right now. And the thing that I have, uh, uh, the reason I think I have optimism and confidence is them is because I think they all have, you know, big hearts. I think they're just, I think we have the right people up here. So they got great character and, and they all are starting to become conscious. You know, if they're good people and you start to become conscious and knowledgeable of these things, then, you know, they can be, you know, the next generation of people that can really truly affect change. Uh, so, you know, I do feel optimistic, you know, but I'm, I'm scared for them. I mean, as a parent, you know, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm 40, 46, I'm almost 47. You know, I've got my daughter, she's 20. She's, she's a junior at Rhode Island. I'm scared for this age group, particularly these young, these young black men. You know, I, I am, I, I've endured it. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've gone out publicly and I've had a couple of interviews, whether it's with CBS or even locally here about some of my interactions, you know, uh, growing up. So I know it's real. I mean, I know it's real, you know, so I'm not talking about just, my friends who I've seen or my cousins, I'm talking about me. So I know that they're going to inevitably uh, uh, have these types of run-ins or interactions. So I'm, I'm scared for them, man. And I, 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 I pray for them each and every day. I feel much more comfortable that they're up here in Rhode Island, you know, with, uh, with around amongst each other and, and with me kind of under my watch right now. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, as a, as a college basketball coach now and, in college basketball, and especially in the ranks that we that we're in, in in terms of the level, um, you're you you're now in A10 and coming to high major basketball in college basketball, there are so many minority basketball players. 
that it's the majority in college basketball. Now, as a coach, you are a minority, an African-American. How do you feel? I mean, what is the, do you feel some type of obligation now or does your mindset change on how you approach things? Or is there a different mindset going through this, knowing that you got a bunch of kids that you have to lead and are looking to you for leadership? How do you approach that, knowing that you are in one of those positions of influence for a lot of young people in this time? Is that something that you approach differently or is that something that, you know, how is that handled? Yeah, no, I, I think I, I've got, speaking of like a mixed bag of emotions, I've got a mixed bag of emotions when you mention something like that. Yeah, I'm one of like, I think something like 95 or 96 African-American head coaches out of about 350 programs. So yes, we are in the minority. I think there are four of us in this particular conference. And uh, and I feel a whole I feel a whole lot of e emotions. I feel one tremendous pride. I mean, tremendous tremendous pride. Uh, I, I feel it, yes, an an absolute obligation, absolutely, uh, to you know to represent <laughs> you know what I mean my community of coaches you know at the highest level, whether that's coaching you know and the off the court. Uh, uh, I feel energized you know about it. To be honest with you, you know I'm one of you know a few that are chosen or blessed to, to have this opportunity. So I feel a, a, a tremendous energy as well to go out there and to, to perform. Uh, I feel fortunate and lucky to be, you know, uh, amongst the one of the 90 or so, you know, head coaches uh, uh, and truly, truly blessed, man. Like, like truly blessed. I don't take this for granted at all. I mean, at, 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 at all. So it's like those mix of emotions that just kind of drives me, drives me every single day. Right. Right, yeah, that that's that's major. I got one final question for you, and um, I, I don't know if Free has any more questions, but I do want to know. You now you're in a position um, as a head coach, and you've been through it for 20 years now. If you if you're looking back and starting over, would you put your family through this again? Oh my goodness, man. You know what? Have, if I knew, if I knew what I didn't know, no, I wouldn't have. No, I, I would have. I would have. No, I probably wouldn't have. In, in all honesty, um, uh, if I knew how it was going to turn out, yes. You know what I mean. Right. But going into it, you know, I was so green. You know what I mean about exactly all the work that this entailed. How many hours I would be away from them? How many days and weekends I would be gone? You know what I mean? You know, 75 days out of the year, you know, I'm probably gone for whatever reason, recruiting, whatever. So, uh, no, no, I, I, I no. So I'm kind of in that regard. I guess I'm glad that I was naive <laughs> because you know it's, it's 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 worked out. It was a long journey, you know, and and it's worked out. But I will I will say this. Uh, yeah, my, 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 my family, man, soldiers, man, like absolutely so. You guys remember when I was coaching AAU, my daughter was just born. You know, she was she was with me in the gym, good. you know what I mean? That, he was yeah, good. all the time, you know, at mm -hmm. one, two, three, three years old. So, you know, that was, first of all, wifey, you know, allowing me to bring her with me, you know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. on some of those trips, you know, Tasha would come and she would support. So they just threw themselves all the way into the mix. And nothing really changed from AAU to college. They just threw themselves in the mix. The only thing changed is I, I had a son. He, and he's now, you know, 13, 14 years old. So, uh, and he's all the way in, you know what I mean? Right. So without that support. So, again, if you're thinking about becoming an assistant coach, you better have that conversation with your significant other. You, yeah. I mean, you, you better try to try to get them to understand. They will never fully understand it until they are actually in the mix. Right. But if they love you and support you and support your dreams and they're willing to at least give it a chance, you know, and then you got to go out there and you got to get it done. That's the other part of the pressure. You know what right. I mean? Like, you know, you got pressure every day from your head coach. He's looking at you to just produce somehow or another every day, produce something. Give me some good news. Give me a recruit. Give me something. And then when you're going home, you know what I mean? You, you better have some success stories, too. You know, or, or the frustration will begin to set in as, you know, what, what are we doing? Are we just spinning our wheels here you know what i mean so you gotta have those conversations yeah because i know going through this rodeo we go through this rodeo every year and i'm we moving from team to team city to city every year and it's a full-time commitment it's a full you have everybody has to be on the same page absolutely communication has to be a thousand i've been married for five years but my you know we've been together for almost eight years nine years and moving around and stuff. So the, <laughs> that's why it, it was a question for me to ask because my family is 
I don't plan on having no more kids. I got three now. I'm done. You know what I'm saying? So I, I have my kids and family is set. I was just wondering as a person that has a family and stuff, and that's that's the land that I'm in, how was that transition for, you know? Because I know Tasha, I remember Tasha, uh, Miss, she being there every step of the way. I remember Layla being in the, in the car yep. with her next yep. to me. Yep. <laughs> Sitting yep. next to me. So that impact of, 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 of having to be in the gym and all that, that takes a toll. Yes. It takes a toll on anybody, yourself, yes. as, as well as your significant others. So um, while we're doing this, I just wanted to, that to be emphasized that people have to understand that coaches have lives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, we do. Coaches yes, we do. Yeah, I got, I got two dogs. I got to walk them in the morning and feed them. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I got to get to the grocery store occasionally. You know what I mean? I, like, yeah, no, I got, I got, I got, yeah, I got responsibilities. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's important that people need to understand. You get so caught up in being obsessive about what you're trying to do to try to create wins and try to create memorable moments in your profession that people take uh, out of accountability is just the fact that you have a family. And that's probably, and that's bigger, you know, in the end. <laughs> that's potentially bigger. So I just wanted to really share some light on that. I don't know if uh, Free got anything, but I definitely wanted to share some light on that. That's good stuff. I appreciate it. I don't know this year, uh, Chris, I don't know if you saw, but I've actually seen Coach Cox get out of character. Oh. I did. I, was, I didn't know who was talking about. He didn't get out of character. He, 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 I was very, very, very happy. How oh, was. okay, 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 <laughs> okay. I see what you're doing here, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 I had, I, I had about a 10-second mental lapse. <laughs> <laughs> I went I went backwards about ten years. <laughs> hey, in, about, yeah, in about in about six hours south, you know, but uh but I recovered. I did recover and that's what it's all about. I, yeah, I, you got it. You're right. You right, you did. Nah, you did it real smooth too. You did it real oh, smooth. Okay. 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 Oh. <laughs> that was good, Freak. That was good. Um, hey man, good to see you dudes, man. No bull, man. Y'all gotta keep me posted on, on literally on everything, man, on all these steps, man. You know, because I know free, I know you you get in that gym, man. You gotta call me sometimes. You gotta, you know, so I can put you on to some professional things I think, you know, would would be good for you. And then and then like I said, Lump, like right now, man, in all honesty, this this coaching thing I don't think is, is gonna go anywhere for you. You got you got the you know, you got the connections, you got the pedigree. But you know how it is with playing, man. If you're gonna be, if you're going out there playing, I'm just this from love right here. Make sure you know all ten toes down. You know what I mean? Because I want you to go out there and stay healthy. You know what I mean? And and and, and be productive. And then you can make this decision. It, it ain't, you know what I mean? It ain't going. It is, it's not going anywhere. I don't think it's, you know, right now. I don't think you're anywhere near any sort of time clock type of situation. Go out there, man, and and and, and enjoy and. Right. And and then and then figure it out. You know what I mean. With so many connections, though, we we'll, you know we'll be able to plug. You. Okay, definitely, man. I appreciate I appreciate the time, man. I know we've been trying to coordinate. This how I know Coach is still the same, Coach Cos. He texts me, look. So we supposed to do this interview yesterday, right? And it's it's, <laughs> it's a game coming on TV, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm like, dang, I should have told him maybe let's do this another time. But <laughs> I was like, I can't tell him. I said, you know, let's reschedule. Coach texts me like three minutes later, like Chris, you know this, you know the TBT championship is on. So you want to do this, <laughs> man? I was hey, like, Chris, nah, you're right. <laughs> hey, hey, I'll be. Let me be honest with you guys, man. I've been so desperate for basketball, man. man. So desperate that about a couple of weeks ago, I caught myself on a Sunday. I had watched about an hour of Ricky Goins' Facebook three on three outside, man. I, I mean, it was, I watched about an hour. This is when Mo Creek was playing. I'm watching it. I'm <laughs> desperate. Like, I'm, I'm desperate. I want to thank, shout out to Ricky Goins, too. Thank you, man. I mean, I, I need anything, anything <laughs> right now. So, yeah, when the TBT, TBT championship, you know what I'm saying, Freak? Free, I got to watch some of that. I got <laughs> to get, get some of that, man. <laughs> right, and they was bumping out there too. Oh, was out there. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, no. sir. But thanks. But all good. We appreciate you, man. We appreciate you sitting down and, and talking so about and spending some knowledge, man. No, nah, no doubt, no doubt. I appreciate y'all, man. Tell the families I said hello. Big O, Big Free, everybody, man. Okay. Yeah, Please yeah. tell the family I said hello. It's crazy yeah. to see everybody all growing up like know, right? years I'm later. Sure. You just said she twenty at. 
going to Rhode Island right now? No, she's going to be a junior. Junior. Oh, my God. Oh, that's, that's crazy, man. Time yeah. flies. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, y'all getting old. <laughs> you getting old. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm 30 now. I can't believe it. That's crazy. Yeah, right. Yeah, right? Yeah, it goes by fast, man. I can remember being in the gym up at Suitland with you, me, free. No doubt. You know, Nolan in there, sweating no it out. Doubt. Yeah. No doubt. The day, e Don coming in. There. Oh, my God. The whole no state doubt. of the tribe coming in. There. From, from that point to now, it's crazy. That, and it seemed like yesterday. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. Enjoy it. Hey, enjoy your family. It's free. Free. You got to give me your status real quick, man. I'm putting you on the spot. You married? No. No kids? No. Oh, free you! Li- oh man, God bless you, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you got li- you really are living free, man. Okay, okay, all right. Well, stay safe, then, my brother. Okay. I will. I will. Hey, as far as you love, hey, enjoy every single day with them kids, man. Because before you know it, like I said, they be ready to they be ready to move, man. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm blessed right now. I got them all still with me, so I, right. I, at least you know what I mean. I'm 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 blessed right now. But when they when they leave. I'm gonna be crying. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I, listen, I don't go nowhere without my crew. We went to the zoo today. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Get it in. laughs> there we go. There we go. That's good stuff. Well, look, I'm out of here, fellas. Good talking to you guys. All, All right. right. See you. All right.